This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Launch Tim Doll, episode 179 in the Emma F and House. Hello, hello. Hello. Are you still ill? Yes, I am. This has <laughs> been um... the cough comes out, is it? Yes, it, no, I, this has been a weird one. It's not COVID, though. Uh, it's cold vid. Yeah, I got a co- first cold I've had in three years. So you're but, not alone. It seems to be going around. It's like, you know, you don't get COVID. You get cold. Vid it, it's a weird one because it's like, oh, I'm getting better. And then and then like evening comes along and just comes soaring back. And it's like, well, what is going on? Just well, like, oh, so I'm going on a week now and it's just still hanging tough. And so I'm, I'm just like, well, I guess I'm try to sleep, but I can't. I'm all. Ugh congested or whatever and no one needs to hear it but yeah well I'm, i mean i'm sure it. a lot of other people are suffering the same fate so maybe they do want to hear it yeah well <laughs> i myself however strangely fine but... well that's not strange for you at all you're <laughs> you're I, I don't think i've ever seen you have a cold i really don't think i've ever seen no, you have a cold no no or the flu just food poisoning. Well, I've seen that. I've said, well, <laughs> well, that you know, seen, yeah. heard. I mean, yeah, food poisoning. But on the road, that's inevitable. You're gonna, you're gonna get, you're gonna eat something. When you eat restaurants all the time, then well, the thing is, the time that I got it in D.C. on our one of our recent, you know, jaunts with retrovirus, I had two bites of a grain salad, and I knew I wasn't gonna eat anymore. And that must have been it, which is bizarre. But that's yeah. who knows. I knew, but I still was very so ill. I. <laughs> Even the promoters asked if I was sure I wanted to go on stage, but being show folk, the show goes on. Well, you did it. I mean, it was it was the night before, and you know, my brother, an epidemiologist for the CDC, when he goes to Africa, the advice is, and it's interesting, the human instincts. They say, you know, obviously, don't be dumb. You know, you, you just try to eat at some place that's got a history, blah blah blah. But if your intuition is something's telling you, yep, uh, maybe don't touch that. Like. Follow your instincts. We have more instincts than we realize. Well, so. I'm glad. I'm glad it would only took two bites to get there. Well, yeah. What well, could you imagine? Being the whole and, fucking and thing. You don't. But that's the thing. People don't expect. I've said this. You've heard me say this many times. When people get sick with Chinese food, it's usually the rice that's been left out too long because that has high bacteria. And I guess this grain might have also been what you know. Oh, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to have this whatever it was. Well, I was puking my guts out. But anyway, that's well, anyways. Well, that was well, well, been worse. I'm I, fine. Well, that's good that you're fine. So sometimes when people do deal with restaurants, they hmm. take it, take it on in a their own unique special way. Um, <laughs> Do tell. Well, there was a KFC in St. Louis, Missouri, and it was a drive through and the customer is like, you know, do you, do you want any sides with that? And he's like, yeah, I want some corn. And they said, oh, we're, we don't have the corn ready. And he starts just going on some epic, insane, violent, screaming rant. They're like, geez, what's up with this guy? So then he pulls up to get it. He's still angry and one of the employees goes out there and says, I'll deal with this. And he goes out and starts talking to the guy. You know, it's going to take 20 minutes if you really want it. But, you know, we're just thinking as a driver. Next thing, the guy, the employee's coming back. He's like, I've been shot. And uh, I guess the, the guy who was upset about the no corn option in, in, in the KFC <laughs> well, it, it, thought he could solve the problem by shooting. The guy. What's interesting is there's all these brawls in McDonald's and KFC and all of these fast food places. And to me, it goes back to the angry gut bacteria that's so Could mad be. that it's not being fed the shit it thrives on that it makes people go kookalooch. I mean, it, it could be. I mean, that's uh, one theory. Well, the guy, <laughs> the guy that shot him just drove off and they, they they're kind of no looking biggie. for him. No well, biggie. I, mean, I mean, St. Louis is <laughs> St. Louis is the top is in the top 50 most dangerous yeah. cities on the planet. It's, uh, you know, of course, excluding cities that are in a country that's officially in a war sure. but but still in the top 50 on the planet i St. mean Louis is no joke. the privilege that people fe- feel they're entitled to but again i'm gonna blame it i'm not gonna blame it look the guy shot the fucking guy for no reason i want my corn god what else i mean, I mean over corn i mean you're i mean i could understand if it was over okra all right <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. i get really pissed off when i don't get my okra Ugh. uh german police <laughs> seek help in solving bull sperm heist yeah Ooh. police in western germany are appealing for help <laughs> in cracking a potentially very cold case now authorities say that about <laughs> 60 containers what the hell are you gonna Whoa. do with it of bull sperm were stolen 
Zeppelin from a farm in the town of Ulfin, 90, uh, you know, 56 miles northeast of Cologne, uh, Monday or Tuesday. And police said that while it's unclear how the Russell, that's what they call it, the <laughs> Russell happened, the precious cargo needs to be super cooled with liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius so it isn't spoiled. They're seeking tips from the public that might lead to the recovery of the sperm, which was intended for artificial insemination. Now, why? I mean, did they think well, did, it was something else? Did they question the farmers? Maybe they were, quote unquote, drinking on the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just read a story. I've never heard of this rapper before. I think her name is Gorilla. Who just claimed? No, no, it's, of, it's it's Glorilla. 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 Did, did you read that? About I know, but she, she's got some singles out right now. I don't well, know. What she claimed on a podcast is a. Uh, they asked her what's her nastiest sexual, you know, predilection. Because uh, I like it when my man comes on my French fries and then I eat them while it's still warm. I'm like, well, maybe she stole the bulls. Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the I, I'm definitely not a prude. I, I'm actually for it. It's so amazing that you have all these like kind of uptight, like <laughs> po politically correct people like on NPR, like oh, someone says something. But then they at the same time kind of celebrate Megan the Salon and Stallion. Right. Like, oh, all these young female rappers. I mean, those lyrics are pretty insane. I, I mean, I'm all for I'm for it. I don't care. It's a vulgar. It sounds like it kind of sounds like a way 11 year old boy would like exactly tell I mean, dirty jokes or something. Well, the vulgarity has topped two live crew who are always a joke to begin with anyway. But speaking of a pretty good prank, Man pretends to be dead for 320 <laughs> for 321 days and gets an acting role on CSI. Nice. And this okay, so a man who posted a TikTok video every day for 300 God, he's got nothing better to do for 321 days pretending to be dead, got what he wanted after landing a dream role as a dead body on CSI Vegas. Sure. It turns out that with hard work, dedication, and several hundred videos of yourself lying on the ground pretending to be dead, you can make it onto a major TV show and have your shot at fame. That's how Kentucky man Josh Nally managed it as a day after day he's posting these fucking videos, pretending to be dead in the hopes that a show would cast him as a corpse. That's well, funny. After 321 painstaking days, he got his wish. CSI Vegas got in touch after noticing the viral star and literally infected, no doubt, with insanity and offered him the chance to play a dead body nice. in one of their episodes. Now, he had no acting experience except acting to dead. But, uh, you know, over time, he's learned how to more convincingly portray a corpse thanks to plenty of practice. He said, I don't like speaking on camera, but I can lie there and act like I'm dead pretty easily. I like this guy. I, I, well, you, you think he's going to get typecasted? Uh, well, he said he's got rid of using the blood and just got better at holding his breath. So not bad. Um, well, I mean, real CSIs, particularly the NYPD, are going to have a le they're going to have less material to work with. Did you hear about the evidence warehouse outside of, uh, well, Red Hook neighborhood? Yes. That burnt down decades of DNA Still evidence, burning. Still uh, burning. Uh, cold cases. I mean, I think that's arson or something. So, some some mob crime shit. Well, I, I think they want to get yeah. rid of shit, get rid of evidence. You're getting hey, rid of so much hey. evidence. It's like when Building Seven went down, which was not hit by an aircraft on 9/11. Ju Rudolph Giuliani's office and all the banking and loan scandals inside. Not to I, be I, a I mean, conspiratist, but I'm just with, with all with all the yeah, all the technology with DNA and all that shit. I mean. There's a a lot of motherfuckers are getting off just because of that fire. And then also there's gonna be a lot of innocent people still going to stay in Absolutely jail because of it. The whole thing sucks. I know. I don't know what to say. Well, I have no idea. Uh, um, I, well, there's been there's there have been some animal attack. Well, uh, <laughs> two shark attacks uh, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, uh, I, I have to cut. I, I'm very I'm, I'm very upset. What's As up? I, well, Mr. P-22. Oh, P-22. They're looking for P-22 right now. Because he's been snatching dogs finally. I mean, you know, I mean, that's what happens when you get fame goes to your head. You start killing things. Um, not not just like, not just like dogs wandering around. It's going up to people walking their dog on a leash. And it's it's with a person next to it and it's kind of stares at the dog and then attacks it. Well, maybe he's looking for the corn at KFC. <laughs> I mean, P-22 and, and, and that uh, kind of. That bracelet, that tracking bracelet, don't they? That's why. I, why can't they find P P twenty two? Because I thought they have a tracking bracelet. Well, uh, maybe or he bit collar, it off. Collar, maybe, he, maybe he bit it off his own <clears throat> neck. But I was.
Uh, I kind of had a crush on his. It's a handsome. It's a handsome Mr. cat. Mr. B22. Yeah, okay. there, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, everyone, a lot of people have their home surveillance cameras now. So there's a lot of footage of that thing just kind of wandering around, around looking for LA, a LA neighborhoods <laughs> in, in the Hollywood <laughs> Hills. Looking it, for a date. So you so you have some people like, hey, I don't really like the fact that there's a mountain lion hanging around or the poop, walking. poop it leaves, all that stuff. And then, of course, there's all these other people like leave it alone. So I don't know. Hey, uh, I it, mean, he 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 went he, he did a pretty good job of that. At least anybody knowing if you heard anything for quite a long time, he kind of was a celebrity. He was a celebrity stalker. I mean, it's it, it is kind of being a little thoughtful i mean it, it it's going for the easier kill like little dogs it's not going after humans so oh, I mean, yeah. not hungry enough yet well i mean i mean uh, mountain lions about what 80 90 pounds i mean they're smaller than a human but they're... they can they can leap like a gazillion <laughs> feet they, they, they got all these other skills that can fuck you up yeah, yeah uh, right. but there but there were two shark attacks in hawaii yeah uh, there was one uh tiger shark this guy was doing his morning swim 400 yards off the beach and a 12 foot tiger shark came and clamped on him but Whoa. he was prepared with his diver's knife and just started stabbing it and it let go and he managed to swim back to his safety, safety and, yes. but unfortunately another woman earlier in the week she got attacked by a tiger shark and she's nowhere to be found her husband said at least he witnessed it and she's gone. So maybe it was a murder. Who knows? Hunting season. Yes. I Anyhow. Mean, shark, shark week's over, but nobody's going according to the calendar anymore anyway. So there there you go. There you go. So, um, all right. Well, I'm, I'm, my head's still in the clouds because I have all this. Oh, me too. Inflamed, I mean, inflamed sinuses. All oh, that stuff. So sorry to hear it. <clears throat> yeah, it I have to, I'll just wrap this up with saying, and it's it's interesting because the first episode I saw quite a while ago, and then you you were uh, you were mentioning how good it was, but I had to consume every episode of Dark Side of the Ring in a mass feeding frenzy like a shark, uh, which is about the mainly the '80s wrestlers, the, their lives of <clears throat> drug abuse, ideas. steroid use, murder, suicide, everything um, you'd imagine. Well, it, it's just it's the forensics of wrestling. I really recommend it to anybody who ever had a wrestling fixation. Well, that, that's the thing. Is this, did at one the point. soap operas that they script are not as exciting as their real lives. Oh, they're, they're real. I mean, did you, see, did you see every single one? I did. <laughs> I couldn't help. I, it. I mean, <laughs> oh, my. Some of them are really tragic, though. I mean, they're, oh, they're all tragic. They're, they're they're all horrifying. I mean, every single one of them is just mania. What about so, what are the, uh, the 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 mantra? How, so, what percentage of professional wrestlers are Canadian? Seems like well, half or something. Well, uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, it's a good. Well, the thing is, they're just damn good wrestlers. I mean, well, half the half the wrestlers are from the Hart family. <laughs> oh, I mean, the Hart family. That, that, that's insane. But who's the guy in Montreal that got sh shot in his own living room? Oh yeah, you I know. mean, uh, just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, whatever. Go watch it, but I'm not letting any cat out of the bag there. Fair All enough. All right. Well, we're gonna go on to our next interview, so we're just gonna wrap this up and say we'll be right back. This is the Lydia and Spin, Tim Doll, Lydia Lunch, episode 179. <laughs> This is the Lydia and Spin, episode number 179 with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Liz Lamiere. Liz, who happens to be, or once was a lawyer, she is a boxer, occasionally manages boxers, musician, composer, ex-punk rock drummer, um, and was just on tour with uh, myself and Mark Hurtado in our tribute to Ellen Vega and the music of Suicide, and she is... She was the partner for many, many years of Alan Vega. And welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you, Lydia. It's great to be here. Great to see Good you. To see you. Are you are you in New York, Liz, right now? I am. I live in downtown Manhattan in, in the financial district. Okay. okay. Or the historic district, as I like to. Oh, all right. Cool. Well, I live in the hysterical district, but that's just <laughs> uh -huh. a state of mind. So, Liz, you just had a new uh, recording out called Keep It Alive. Is it on in the Red Records? It is. And Henry Rollins actually introduced me to Larry Hardy at In the Red. Um, you know, I did the album for myself, basically. And once it was done, hesitant to share it. But Henry's always been amazing. So I sent it to him and he immediately got back like, oh, I love every track. This must be released. So 
So and that's kind of how that started. And were you doing material from that on this on this tour that we just did? I was. I was basically okay. performing the album. Okay. Um, I added a track at the beginning of the set and at the end of the set, the, the last song that I did called King City Ghost, which I wrote about Alan Vega and King of the Bums. Oh, I love that story. Please <laughs> tell that story. It's a great story. Okay. Well, Alan used to refer to himself as the King of the Bums, but the genesis of that was, must have been in the early 70s, and he's sitting in a, um, a you know little cafe in the village, and he's pretty deeply embedded in the space. And he looks in his writing. He used to always draw and do his writings and just musings. And he looks up and in the doorway of the, of the cafe is this figure. And it's a, it's a man with a long beard and a trench coat and he's lit from behind. And Alan was just like taken by this image. And he starts to weave his way through the space with, with a sense of purpose. Like Alan just knew he was coming to him. Sure enough, he looks up and he's standing at the foot of Alan's table and he's like, I'm the king of the bums. And when I die, you'll be the king of the bums. Ooh. And that was it. I mean, <laughs> he was ordained. <laughs> well. That's funny. That's a good well, one. Yeah. But Alan so now he's King he City Ghost, King of now, the Bums. Now he's King City Ghost, King of the Bums. When did you meet Alan? I met Alan in 1985 and I was leading a bit of a dual life myself because I was, you know, I had played drums in bands growing up. I was always just, you know, into sports and music and didn't really have any career aspirations. In fact, I thought, oh, I'll go to law school. How hard could that be? Then I'll have some financial security and then I can just do music for fun. So I was playing drums in a band and one of the women who I work, I was also working as a, a corporate lawyer on Wall Street. And one of the women who was a friend of mine, her brother was Mark Kuczynski, Kuch, who played guitar in the early iteration of the Alan Vega band back in the early 80s. So Dory invited me to go to, there was a record release party that Electra Records was throwing for Alan's latest release on Electra Records, Just a Million Dreams. So this must have been 1985. And they picked me up. We went to pick up Alan at the Gramercy Park Hotel. He opens the door. I'm completely thunderstruck. There's uh, light sculptures on the walls and he's got this, all these effects pedals on the floor all linked together. And he looked like a lunatic and his whole energy was intense. And I did not look like a Wall Street lawyer. I had a spike in my nose, combat boots. And I looked like something that had crawled out from under a rock. So he, and, and he's like saying to Dory, this is your friend who's a lawyer? This was a, it's just really, yeah, so it was a crazy, crazy time. But the, the quick answer is 1985. And we were together for 31 years when he passed because we were pretty much together from, from that point on. He had just gone, he had went away shortly thereafter on tour with his band. But as soon as he came back, we reconnected and, and were together. Okay. Nice. Well, how was it? How, how did you feel about being on tour on this little jaunt we were just on? Because I, I have to say, you know, being honored by doing the music of Alan and Suicide is just, it's such a joy to me. It's so much fun. It's, it's, it's mandatory. And I, I thank you and I thank Alan for blessing this project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Lydia, it, it feels, you know, it was kind of divine intervention that back when Alan was supposed to do the first uh, tour doing those, you know, those shows with Mark Hurtado and he was not able to go. And Mark thought of you immediately and Alan said, perfect. So this was way back when you first did it. Yeah. So for me, it was kind of coming full circle because for many years, Alan was always saying, oh, you got to do your own music. And, you know, it wasn't until after he passed that I started work. Cause I'm like, what am I going to say? You know, the music is the easy part. And I had worked with him in the studio for almost 30 years. And I was playing a lot of those machines. I was, you know, coming up with like little hooky riffs and all this kind of stuff and, and producing a lot of the later work with him. So I learned a lot during that time. But for me, the biggest challenge was, what am I going to say? And I started writing in journals. So I had a lot of, you know, thoughts that I had written down. So for me, though, I had never toured. I had never performed live, <laughs> any of that kind of stuff. Other than a couple of times, Jeff, my friend Jesse Mallon had invited me to do like the suicide uh, 
you know, tribute, uh, right? The tribute. tribute. Exactly. Uh, and I hear you did the cramps tribute as and well. I did the cramps three times. Yeah, three three years I did the cramps. Those are the only times I've gotten up on stage, like front and said, I'd be with Vega, but I'd be in the back. And I'm like, no one's watching me. I could just play my little effects machines. And I would feed him some of the lyrics because he never wanted to remember. Hey, just like me, wow. we had a lot in right? common. A I lot remember. in common. So, and yeah. him, that was, he's like, if I had to be Mick Jagger and get up there every day and recreate the albums, I'd kill myself. You know, he... <laughs> had to be in the moment he never did sound check even with suicide with marty they just meet on stage half the time he wouldn't even know what the set list was going to be he didn't want to know so but you, you know, had to take you had to take a different approach because you have to know what you're doing and it was you're we, you did four shows with us but it was very organized what you did you knew what you were going to do you had on your hot cat suits you had your boxing poses going uh it was uh, pretty pr pretty tremendous Thank you. No, I, I loved it. I loved every moment to me because the, the energy and the, the focus for me, because the I, I'm going to sound like Alan used to say, the last thing I wanted to do was get on stage, but I'm the same way. It's like, don't take my picture. Don't look at me. Da, 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 da. But then the power and the, and the, the feeling that you get, it's like jumping out of the airplane without a parachute. It's the same feeling I get when I step into the ring, right? That intensity, that a focus and purpose and, like, and your life is on the line. I love that. I, I, I guess I'm an adrenaline junkie, but I absolutely love that. Well, so it's just hi hyper presence. It's just keeping it uh, yeah. being being very present. In fact, Tim, Tim, Tim and I are very into hyper presence. Yeah, uh, why not? And, and in the moment as well. So that's just I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, near death experiences, sexual experiences. These are all hyper present experiences, and and performing is definitely one. I mean, it's 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 every second counts, and never and all eyes are on you. So. There is a, uh, a rush for sure. Was was Marty asked to do any of these or uh, how was their relationship towards the end of uh, Alan's life? Was it? Uh... It was pretty much the same as it always was. They had a very interesting relationship. Alan was a lot closer day to day to Rick Ocasek. Rick was like, you know, he would call him regularly and they would talk in the middle of the night. When did Rick die? He died uh... in 2019, September of 2019. So three, three, years after Alan. Three, three years after. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, it, and it was really, it was really tough for Rick and he and I stayed in touch somewhat, um, but you know, it was, it was obviously very difficult, but Marty and Alan, you know, it was, it was more like a brother type thing. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they clashed a little bit. They were very different people. Um, but when they came together, I mean, that crazy magic just happened on stage, sure. you know? Sure. And I think that that's, um, it, that never changed. And there was never any kind of people would say, oh, suicide broke up when Alan started his solo career. No, not at all. Not at all. It was just they each, as Alan used to say, it was like a democracy, right? They they're, mm -hmm. they have to kind of come together and agree on things and each needed to do kind of their own thing. Yeah, yeah. You, can be a you can be a dictator or if you're in a band, suddenly there's diplomacy and that's that changes things. A little well, bit. that's in some bands, Tim. No, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm a dictator. All right. Yeah. What, what about Bruce Springsteen? Did he stay in touch with did, did those two stay in touch? Not so much. I mean, Bruce would run into Rick and say, hey, how's Vega doing? And of course, you know, Alan, Jesse Mallon reached out to Alan because he had done some stuff with Bruce and Bruce would say, hey, you see Alan Vega. And Jesse invited Alan to go to I think it was Bridgeport, Connecticut, when Bruce was doing the Devils and Dust tour, because he would end every set with Dream Baby Dream. Right. And so Jesse brought Alan and it was in a, it was for Alan. It was a, a wonderful time. You know, it, for, it meant so much because so Bruce was like such a regular guy. You know, he they get there for sound check. Bruce jumps off the stage, gives Alan a big bear hug. They're, they all he eats with the band in between, you know, before the set. He's just he's very present with with um did, with did, everyone. did Bruce covering that song secure Alan's retirement mm -hmm. fund? <laughs> I hope I, you know it's interesting they were getting really really strong offers to perform well before that and yeah and and surprisingly the publishing income was starting to come in they were starting to get a fair amount of their songs placed you know so the Sopranos Entourage you know some of those early tv shows yeah started to see the signs then and um but of course Bruce was that was next level and then having he almost played it when he did the um, halftime at the Super Bowl. Wow. Uh, he almost d sang Dream Baby Dream. And now what, what made him pull it? His, I think his management. 
that was that was the story we got. You know, that, really. Why I mean, not do one of one of your own songs off your new album no, instead? I think he did some some covers. I, I try to remember that one, but I. But the thing is also the, the Super Bowl. They're like medleys. You get like right. thirty yeah, seconds of 30 all these different songs. Yeah, yeah. But that didn't happen. But it was in the um, the World Series. So and Alan would have loved because Alan was a huge sports fanatic. So any connection to sports, having his music that's, in there, that's funny. Yeah, he would have been really happy. Who, who are his favorite teams? Everything. He watched everything, and he had an encyclopedic knowledge of. Well, you 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 know what though? If you you know in New York City as a male, you want to be able to venture anywhere you want, and you want you end up in a pretty rough bar. Knowing sports <laughs> sports statistics can get you out of a lot of trouble. Yeah, knowing crime st- knowing crime statistics gets me out of a lot of trouble <laughs> and gets the cops into a lot more. But it's true, trouble. it's true. You, people are it's like, what's so this person? True. You can, because then you start mingling with like guys that maybe you wouldn't mingle with otherwise, and they might not like you otherwise. Well, speaking about sports though, Liz, what made you get into boxing? And I understand because uh, as an amateur in my basement when I had them wherever I lived, I had to have that heavyweight bag because. I just yeah, I just think it's the best form of exercise and you got to know how to throw a blow. Mm-hmm. No, ab- absolutely. And I grew up in Boston with two older brothers, very sports oriented family. I played four years of varsity soccer in college. I was a ski instructor. I was really, you know, kind ski of rough in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up near a very small ski area just outside of Boston, but it was a sheet of ice. It was just, the vertical drop was pretty intense. And it I was think, well, they say if you can ski New England, you can ski you anywhere, ski anywhere because it's, it's just you go down, come around a corner. It's a hockey rink for about 300 yards. I go, that, boy. That's right. And I played ice hockey, too, with my brothers. You did. So, yeah. Yeah. Which so, town was this? Because what's the big boxing it town? Mass. It was just no Brockton. Brockton is the, is yeah. the big, well, that's Boston also the big town. boxing town. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's like uh, Rocky Marciano's from there, right? Exactly. Mar- yeah. Marvin Hagler's from there. Marvin Hagler, uh, Mickey Ward. I don't know if Mickey Ward was from Brockton, but bo- certainly Boston. Do you, do you have a favorite any favorite boxing boxers? Um, you know, it's always changing. Of course, I, Floyd Mayweather is, you know, still right up there in terms of incredible defense, you know, we <laughs> hit and not get hit. Um, Lomachenko now is, is incredible. Some of the women are really getting good recognition now. So I love do you like, M- do you like MMA? Not as much. Not I think the boxing for me is more. It's more of the sweet science, whereas MMA seems to be more of a free for all. Right, totally. And I just kind of cringe. <laughs> like, like boxing is like a chess match. Sure. But no, I, I got into it because I was coaching my son's uh, soccer team. And by the time the kids were getting a little older, we kept walking over to the ball fields and I kept passing this traditional boxing gym, Trinity Boxing Club. And they're playing hip hop music and just the whole vibe was, you know, Martin Snow, the owner, collects memorabilia. So the place really looked legit. And I'm like, okay, I, if I really want to stay strong and vital, you know, I was already in my forties and I'm thinking, geez, I need to challenge myself. So I walked in one day and I just, I never stopped from that moment. I was completely hooked. And I said, look, this is not an aerobics thing for me. I'm not looking to meet hot guys. Although, you know, hello, <laughs> hello, occasionally. Um, Occasionally, right? If they're on the uh, menu. Exactly. But I want to learn how to fight. And I want you to come at me as, with bad intentions. Like you're really uh, trying to take me out because that's the only way I'm going to really learn, right? How to, how to defend my and protect myself at all times. And I got very aggressive early on because the guys weren't trying to throw punches directly to my face. So I'd be trying to really, you know, hit them you know, break their nose. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I started, I told Alan, Alan, it was really funny. His reaction was great. He's like, Oh, I really like your nose. Please, you know, don't get hurt. And I'm like, Oh, don't worry. I won't spar. And then like after two weeks, I'm like, okay, I'm going to spar, but I'll only spar with the guys and their pros. And I'll tell them that my husband doesn't want me to break my nose. <laughs> so, you know, from there just, and then it morphed into me starting to manage some of the fighters. Cause it's a really, really hard sport I can when imagine. You're coming up through the ranks, you know, to get oh, yeah. to that level where you can start making money, you yeah. have to sell tickets, get, you know, there's a lot of, oh, yeah, so having, the lineup, of having a legal background helps because there's so much corruption in any kind of sports oh. field. And I mean, there's so much abuse of the, of the part of, you know, of the people in sports who don't know. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that they don't realize that the opponents are getting paid and the prospect is getting in there and just trying to get, you know, sell tickets and keep building their record. 
till they get to about 10 wins and then they have to step up and really go against other prospects. So it's not right. like they're being put in with a tomato can, but early on, you know, it's not that the fix is in because anytime you step in, anything can happen in boxing. Yeah. And some of these opponents are really scrappy and they're coming to win. They're not, you know, yeah. so it's, it's crazy. And the, for the women, it was really hard to, it was hard for them to get fights. Uh, the promoter's like, oh, no one wants to see women fight, which, which is, is such is bullshit. False, false, Total false. bullshit. The yeah. women are crazy. They're yeah. sick. I mean, the, the most intense and exciting fights tend to be the women because yeah. they go full tilt. They're not fucking around. You know, whereas the men, it's almost like the more advanced they become and the more they have to lose, the more risk averse they become too. Now they're really boxing. They might've been like a real brawler puncher. And now they're like, okay, now I'm going to outbox my opponent so I don't get hit with something stupid. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, everything that I've built is, is out the window. Do you, think, so. do you think that would change if, uh, cause you know, the, the jackpot's different for you know, yeah. if it's, you know, based on the popularity and the rank of someone, um, a superstar is going to get paid a lot mm -hmm. more. Right. If, if it was all or nothing, don't you think be, that would be a real fucking fight? Right. I mean, right? and I That's guess the, street, right. They, they would never do that, of course. No, um, it's a business. Yeah. It's all about the bottom line. So like anything else. Did you ever go to Jimmy's Corner, the bar? And uh, no, where's, where's that? That, that, that's it's one of the last it's like a boxing bar near Times Square. It's still there. And it's one of Muhammad Ali's coaches. <laughs> I just, just like, I don't know, maybe his a professional boxer like that has like a, a main coach and they have all these trainers. It's one of his trait. Yeah, he's okay. his corner, Jimmy's corner. There right. you go. And uh, ah, it's a classic. So uh, I don't know. I got to check that out. I should probably know it. And when I when I do a little research, I'm like, oh, right, of course. Yeah, I mean, how often many, that's the other thing about boxing. There's so many characters. How, oh, but yeah. how often does anybody go to Times Square at this point, which is like Disney? There you anyway. go. Right. I mean, who wants right? to go up there for? Well, if you just time. happen to be up there, which you don't want to be, it's like, what the fuck do I do? It's like, well, there's Jimmy's Corner. Or you that's just go up for Jimmy's Corner. There you go. There's another great boxing, well, owned by some um, former boxers, Celtic Playhouse. I think it's on like 48th in Times Square, just just above Times Square. And one of the one of my first trainers became a, a world champ, middleweight world champion, Kid Chocolate. <laughs> I wasn't his manager, but I gave him some legal advice when he signed to first Oscar De La Hoya and then Al Heyman. And uh, he, he did really well for a while and then defended his title a few times and retired with financial security. So he's a good success story. A lot of these guys, you know, it's, they're just, they have to do it. And it's a really brutal sport. But isn't uh, Mike P Tyson is the biggest blown sports fortune of all time? <laughs> I, I, I think I think he blew through like six hundred million dollars. Wow! I, I, well, I mean, that, that, that's also Tomato would be so upset about that because you know he was such a good that was his, for him. right, right. And then yeah, when he died, it all kind of went down the tube. It's also managers ripping people off. It's I was just gonna say it's, it's like so well. Many it's Tyson hard to spend six hundred million. No, but Tyson had like a Bad advice a, a mansion in in Long Island with like. 30 bathrooms and he made sure every bathtub was made of gold well, and he's I making mean, and decisions stupid, like that yeah, exactly. just, yeah. stupidity can waste a lot of money <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah they'll exactly. be fighting on the street corner and no <laughs> boxing bums on the subway did did alan alan like boxing well that's one of the things interesting question to him because he had boxers he had mike tyson in one of his sculptures in like the 70s before mike was like would it have been the 70s I mean, I'm Mike, I mean, before, he, before he was known, so he, probably he late seventies, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he used to um, get ring magazine. I mean, he started watching boxing from the time he was a kid and he okay. grew up, you know, he was born in 38, which people don't realize that he was 10 years younger, right. older than right. Right. So he saw, you know, was listening to boxing on the radio um, and he's started reading ring magazine early on. He would pull, pick, you know, photos of boxers out, put them in his sculptures. And then later in life, he started doing what, a series of boxer paintings where he would pull out the most damaged faces and he would put them on these small canvas uh, boxes and then paint them over with black and then and then scratch away to get the images coming through. They look like old master's paintings. They're really quite amazing. Is Alan Vegas boxer painting series. Where are those? Are those anywhere? I have I have 28 here and in Paris in the Godin Gallery, they still have about 30. Um, they sold 20 or 19 
in 2012 when there was the, a big um, international art festival that Alan went over to and, and the Godin Gallery had, uh, it's like the Armory show, right? The FIAC. And one whole booth was all Alan Vega, light sculptures, a wall of those boxer paintings in the shape of a cross. There were 19 of them. One collector bought the whole thing. And that was crazy. I mean, that that day was an amazing day because they sold out the booth. Alan was there. It was six months after he almost died from a stroke and a heart attack. People didn't realize how how serious that was in 2012 okay. uh, when he died because he continued to do his art. He continued to do shows. We flew over to Paris. Not only did he have the art show at the, the major, major art uh, exhibition, but he had a, um, he did a, a performance of music performance with Mark Hurtado and myself and Dante. Um, we had uh, a showing of a film that he had done in the 70s at Silencio David Lynch's club. I mean, it was like four or five days of nonstop. And the man was like, incredible. I mean, because he could have dropped at any point. Well, and look, let's face it, artists, musicians, actors, even there's a chance they might drop on stage and they'd probably mm -hmm. better go that they would probably prefer to go that way than right? uh, in the back garden digging a tulip bed. Yep. And didn't Johnny Thunders, I mean, people used to go watch, <laughs> is he going to die on stage tonight? Is he going to OD? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm sure that's, that's part of it. And the same thing with Alan would always say, people would come up to him and say like, Oh, you're still doing music or you're still doing, he's like, am I still breathing? I mean, hey. what kind of a question is that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's born in the thirties. There's just a very, my father was born in the thirties and it's, there's definitely a difference between uh, the baby boomers and that, and to, you know, that you touch the Great Depression in some way. There's, mm -hmm. there's just a, a scrappier kind of uh, characteristic. I mean, I'm generalizing, of course, but just getting to hear the stories, uh, it, it's painting a better picture, actually, of who this person is. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah I mean, survival mode. And what you said before about like every man and being in the, you know, knowing sports and being in the bar, Alan didn't hang out on the music scene. He would go to the Killarney Rose or the Blarney Stone. Yeah. Right. And he was a regular there where, right. you know, because at night he'd like to have his vodka. He'd go out at like midnight, spend an hour, have a couple of drinks, come home, write, draw. But he was, he's hanging out with like everyday people. Yeah. You know, he wanted the stories. He, he related to the stories. I mean, did the old was... Blarney Stone ever close? Wasn't that like just constantly just open? Like 2024 no, 20, seven? That's probably. probably. Good question, Tim. Good question. <laughs> uh, which Blarney Stone? The one on Canal Street? No, the one no. down at Trinity Place. Oh, right yeah. Because okay. yeah, uh -huh. we live right down there. Yeah. And then there's another, there's a Killarney Rose, which is like right on the block. Yeah. Well, there, there was a Blarney, I was actually thinking of the Blarney Stone of the old Times Square, that was like on 8th Avenue up there. Mm -hmm. And that would just be just these kind of local hobo-ish guys, 24-7, yeah. just never yeah. stopped. And there'd be like eight people in there or something. It's the same uh, kind of thing. You'd have the guys who would work down here in the financial district. And Alan loved living down here because it was, at least in the early days, right? It was a ghost town at night. Exactly, so yeah. You'd walk all around the streets Nothing. and the streets are not on a grid, right? It's all cobblestone, right. all the old historic buildings and you're surrounded by water. And he would just go out and roam the streets at night. And nobody was out there. Right. Unfortunately, roaming the street one night when he was 71 years old, um, he got beaten up by three white hoodlums who he thought were pretty hopped up on, on something when he was coming home from the Blarney. Was he, he hospitalized? 25 staples oh closed the back of his head. Jesus. 12 stitches in his forehead. I know people don't realize this either. He's 71 years old. They smashed him against the, the wall of the building cracked open his head, threw him into the street, crack, cracked open his forehead. He managed to walk home here and, you know, his, it, it really didn't stop him. Although he did write a song on his last album called It. And the name of the song was Prophecy. And it's like, I get knocked down. I will get up. I will go on and on because that is my prophecy. And it's like, you know, you, you can't kill me, motherfuckers. You know, he, he, it didn't, it really didn't stop him. But when he was 73, he ended up having a stroke and a heart attack. He lived four years after that. And then unfortunately he fell and broke, he was, he, his knees were really bad. He had really bad arthritis and he fell and broke his hip. And it was the, and he did fine. I mean, his, his, after the stroke,
stroke, his cardiologist loved him. The whole team, I mean, he was crazy. At first they thought he was insane, Mm -hmm. but then they grew to love him. And he was doing pretty well until obviously. So they got the best anesthesiologist to do the, uh, to, you know, put him under for the hip surgery because they were worried about that. And he came through fine, but then he got some kind of fucking infection in the hospital. Yeah. And then he couldn't, he could, so he couldn't get it exactly. And I used to say it, I felt so guilty because I would say, if you fall and break your hip, it's game over. So <laughs> what happens? He falls and breaks his hip. Uh, so we end up in the hospital like three weeks longer than he should have been before he could start rehab. And it was the rehab that just ultimately was too much on his heart. And he just passed in the middle of the night, uh, one night from just heart failure. His heart just stopped. Yeah. So anyway, on a, on a positive note. Though. Well, I mean, on a positive note is he's still with us in many forms today through his music, uh, through uh, whenever keep it alive. to keeping it alive, yeah. uh, as the name of your new record is, Keep It Alive, and through uh, just his spirit, as you well mm-hmm. know from our meeting the other day. Yeah, no, it's that was pretty amazing, Lydia, because the, the psychic who you brought she was speaking in Alan's voice. I mean, you can't fake that, you know, unless, unless you spend time with him, just the vernacular, just the mannerisms. But I mean, I'm upstairs, like, enough already. You know, come down. It's like, Jas- Jasmine and I gave Liz a reading and uh, Alan was right there. Yeah, it was, it was, was pretty right intense. There. But it, it's funny because it really um, solidified a lot of things that he's very present. And, you know, you don't spend 31 years with someone and collaborate with them and everything that, you know, we, we went through together and raising a son and, and everything else without really intimately knowing each other and continuing that. So he's very present with me at all times. Um, he's really excited about what's happening, not only for me and for Dante, who's now a sound engineer and, and a fucking amazing one. And just for the, the recognition of everything that he did for so many years, Um, Not only his visual art, because he, you know, he had that rare thing where he was somebody who's considered extremely innovative and created a style of art with his light sculptures. And Jeffrey Deitch, who's a very well regarded and well known um, art dealer um, and historian, would say, you know, Alan really created his own thing in art. And he, together with with Martin, created their own thing yeah, uh, with music. suicide and music. Absolutely. And he and I, the, the work that we did together, experimenting with sound, it might not have been as popular as the stuff that we did starting in the 90s to the end. And that's what I'm bringing to light now. Uh, Jared Narto and I co-produced an album called Mutator, which was just one of the many basic, like we call it lost recordings, because over 30 years, we only released about eight, I think, yeah, eight al- studio albums. But we would create what would be albums. And then Alan would, every time he discovered something new or he felt like he was in a new direction, he would just move forward. He never looked behind. And I would be the one every once in a while saying, hey, can we put together an album? I want to go on tour, you know, go see Europe or whatever. Um, and so we would, but there was all this other material. There's probably about another 10 albums worth of material in the archives. So we're excavating now. We've also found amazing stuff from the early 80s, from suicide, live mm. stuff that, that is still unreleased that we're cool. putting out. Yeah, so there's so much more to come from Vega. We never had any social media until 2019 when I started working with Jared on social media as well. So, you know, just the awareness that, this wasn't just, hey, that's that singer from Suicide. You know, he was so much more than that. Sure. Um, so that's really cool. And for me, I just, I feel so grateful to have spent so much time with him, ex- really seeing and being part of his creative process. Because for Alan, there were no expectations. There were no mistakes. You had to be in the moment. And as Lydia alluded to before, she can tell I'm, I'm more of a planner and very organized. <laughs> I had my thing all set up that was not Alan. It was like, he did not want to have any preconceived plans on anything. He just was purely in the moment. It was so freeing for me. So um, I feel very grateful for that. So Liz, what's coming up next? What's on your plate? So the record just came out, Keep It Alive. When did it come out actually? Well, no, it came came out in the spring. Okay. Um, And I did a couple of videos for it. 
And uh, next is, well, right after I did that, I actually did a collaboration with a hip hop artist. I did all the music and then he and I traded verses and whatnot. One of those songs I did uh, kind of a, a redo of Cheap Soul Crash called Crash Cheap Soul. And I've got Alan's vocal on it. One of those other alternate performances from the 2007 album track, Cheap Soul Crash. Um, so that's probably something that I'm going to want to see the light of day at some point, but I wanted my solo thing to come out first. Um, I'm about halfway through the next album. Oh, great. Dante's once again, my engineer, and it's amazing. Your son, I, Dante, who is I, also on the tour, who's a great guy. He really is. He's 24 going on, I don't know, old soul. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's working in as an engineer in studios now already, too. He, he's like going into production. Yeah, he's doing really well. He works at a studio called Fight Club um, with some high Perfect. profile artists. <laughs> yep. Yep. But he also has three other studios where he brings his own clients. So and the studio that we set up here during lockdown. So where we where we record. So I record at home, which is great. Um, what else? I'm writing the Alan Vega biography. Um, back with beat books. Um, I was interviewed in the New York Times once Mutator came out and Lee Sobel, a literary agent, reached out to me based on that and said, hey, there's a real interesting backstory of Alan's, you know, history. Because people really didn't know the whole back. And it's pretty crazy. Uh, his first wife was a Holocaust survivor. I mean, there's just a lot of really interesting uh, stuff. So I've been writing that biography with a, with a um, co-writer uh, who co-wrote Michael Alago's book. Oh, so, yeah. I love Michael Alago. Right? Laura Davis Chapin. Yeah, That's so she's great. she's amazing too. And she was a drummer and a lawyer. So okay. Lee thought we might have a nice connection there. But anyway, so that's been a, a huge um, part of my day to day. Were the two of you down in the financial district when 9-11 happened? Oh, absolutely. So did, you, did, you have, did you have to leave your apartment or your place for a while? How did that well, work? Well, yeah, here's what happened. I, I worked uptown. So I had my little day job and I was uptown. Uh, 53rd and 7th and I put my sneakers on and ran home but Alan was home Dante had not started preschool yet Dante was two uh, Rick called and woke up Alan and said hey, Alan da, 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 this is turn on the TV and it's literally about four blocks away but we were southeast of the of the site so when the when the twin towers came down the black and the soot and everything yeah. else yeah, that went right across. I was, I'm running home and I'm about Canal Street when the second tower collapsed. And I right. saw this huge, and then you had all the National Guard and everyone's poor. I was going in the opposite direction, right? Because everyone's pouring uptown. And I had called Alan before I left. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, so I knew he was home. And the police and the National Guard are saying, like, everyone's evacuating. I'm like, no, there's no way. I, my husband is, and son are there. Which means you guys had an analog landline because that was the only way you could have made a, a phone call right um i called from the office yeah from I the office from but, but for alan to be able to pick it up at the house exactly yeah and they we didn't lose electricity um but at that point i you know everything was pretty much shut down at, after the second i think i left at when the first tower collapsed is when i hit the street yeah. And then, as I said, I was at about Canal Street when the second one came down. Yeah, but it was crazy. He wasn't going anywhere. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. But you know what is really pretty, I don't know, it's, and again, it's like a metaphor for, for I don't know, life and existence and, and, the, and the, the, the dichotomy between beauty and despair and, and, and insanity. But we walked up to the site about maybe a day or two later, and that metal sculpture claw the claw that, like they're kind right? of like that the, crazy right yeah that spokes the claw it's kind of bent yes. and, and the smoke it's still burning in the smoke and well, it was and on it fire was for like unset. a month still right it took like a month before they really put out the oh fire. yeah no and this was just a couple of days okay. later and yeah. alan and i stood there we're on like the you know maybe half a block away and we're we're we look at each other and we both had the same thought like is it wrong to find this like exquisitely beautiful like there was something like incredibly powerful and beautiful about this sculpture. well you know we, we filter these things in our own ways and that's that's not wrong i mean i you know there was i went underneath it because the, it the two train used to have the world trade center stop yes. and, and then and, and it got redirected but for like like 
The week afterwards, they didn't. Now, of course, they didn't stop there, but you'd kind of crawl, and it was all dark. And then Thank everyone, you, Tim. And then I every, did it too. You, you did it too. So then I did it too because my fucking lunatic bosses are like, "You got to get into the office." Well, so, so, so then carry on. I remember. So I, all of a sudden, like we're 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 going because I was living in Brooklyn, or I do live in Brooklyn still, but I was coming from Brooklyn, and then suddenly it's like, okay, we're not stopping here, but you had to go through it, and it was just this crawl, and then everyone got off their seats. And basically their hands are and faces are against the glass to look at like pillars and soot and dust everywhere. But we'll never forget that we're underneath. We're underneath the whole thing. Yes, I, exactly. I, I, I tell people about that and they're like, what? I was like, yeah, for like a week, you could still do that while still Thank on you. fire. I upstairs. will never forget that experience. Yes. I'm like, what are we insane? We're literally under underneath like- it. Yeah, I saw that. Holy shit. Yeah. Yep. Wow. I, I don't even want to speak about 9-11 after reading about a thousand articles on it because uh, it's just too much. I just can't. All right. Well, then we'll talk about something else. We'll, we'll talk I'm about something else. Into my theories about we'll, we'll talk about something I'm else. I'm just happy. Well, that's the other thing. Yeah, you and Alan would have had a field day on so, that. So if you're writing the bi- biography, I mean, this is uh, there's so many archives that you have to go through that are you're in your possession. But then you're also probably going and researching and doing all this other stuff as well. That's a big process. And of course, there's an emotional side to it as well. And how, how do you approach it in a more objective way? Or are you, are you deciding um, that or you're just going to emotional way? Or you're just going to do it through your lens? Uh, yeah, I'm doing, well, I'm doing part the part that of my life with Alan through my lens. And that's why it's good to have a co-writer, because she's interviewing all the people from his prior life. Um, I'm doing a lot of interviews. And Lydia, I would love you to be part of it, too, where I'm just just very general questions to people. What any Thank experiences you. you want to share about your your time with Alan? And so there's going to be a lot of that in it as well. Um, a lot yeah, of after photos, passed, photos of the art. I hope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. No, there's there's going to be. Um, it, it it has been intense, Tim. And 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 since he passed, just the whole Michael Alago came over, and we immediately after, and we went through so much stuff because Alan was a collector. He would pull in stuff off the street for his light sculptures. Um, so there was a lot. There's a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty intense. It's it's pretty intense. But I think uh, you know it's something that needs to be done, and I think and, I'm, and you need to do it. And I need to do it. Yes, yeah, cathartic as well. As yeah. and, and also yeah. because he is, you know, he is still with you. I mean, this is what I say about any intense relationship, no matter how short or how long, is that the feelings you have in that relationship change you organically and chemically. And if you can maintain the presence of the beauty and the love of that relationship at its peak, that alters you for the better. And when somebody is gone for whatever reason, whether it's a breakup or whether it's death, if you could keep within you that love that you had, that you then bring elsewhere, that is the definition of excelling in this life. Thank you. Yes. That's beautiful. And I feel that. Yeah. Thank you for expressing that. Because <laughs> how, did, how did Rick Ocasek and... Alan meet. <laughs> I believe it was at the rat in Kenmore Square in Boston. In Boston. Okay. Yeah. Oh, when the rat. Oh, played the rat. I know I used to sneak in when I was like 16. I played drums and backward flying Indians. You know, my boyfriend and I used to sneak into the rat because back then the drinking age was like 18. But anyway, yeah. So Rick um, was just blown away by this whatever it was that that suicide were doing at the rat. Well, and- I know that's interesting because both Bruce Springsteen and and Rick Ocasek, the cars, they're so, uh, you know, Bruce being more political, but they're so straight. The music is mm-hmm. so mainstream, but they could recognize something they wish they had or mm-hmm. tried to tap into, which is this extreme, perverse, yet beautiful psychedelic power. Mm hmm. Was was Rick uh, famous already when he saw him at the Rat? Yeah, I think the cars were pretty pretty popular. I don't know how big they had blown up by then, but they were certainly well in, Bo- in Boston. They, they definitely were. Boston, were. they were like local gods. Yeah, for sure. Right, like Jonathan Richmond, you know, in the Modern Lovers. But then, of course, they just <laughs> took to a whole <laughs> right back then. Right. Yeah. Right. So well, yeah. how about how about the concerts? I mean, it didn't Suicide open for the Cars a few they times, did. and this is to mm-hmm. me just epic epic history because 
fuck you, you mainstream audiences throwing exactly. shit and who the fuck cares? I mean, just the boldness of And that. the promoters who are freaking out because oh. first of all, the way Alan looked in LA, he was head to toe leather and chains That's with funny. suicide and studs on his jacket. He went out to get a sandwich and the, the hotel <laughs> is like, oh, it's a 10 minute walk, you know? No, it wasn't. He's walking, nobody walks in LA. Yeah. And all of a sudden a helicopter light he tells this story, he came beaming down. <laughs> I'm like, that's funny. What are you doing in the street? That tells you the performance already. Right? Yeah, exactly. The spotlight on him with a helicopter. Above him. Holy shit. He and broke then the into Frankie teardrop on the LA sidewalks. Right. Nobody yeah, saw it but the cops. It was epic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then the excited are telling like. Rick, don't let him swear on stage. So, so you know. Oh my God. Yeah, they're there. Yeah. So Rick comes out and is like, motherfuckers fuck you you know like because bob hopes apparently bob hopes house was like on the hill oh. we don't want to we don't want to disturb him <laughs> wait <laughs> is it illegal to swear i don't I get it no idea but they're actually alan said that they were he was told he was admonished but, there's no swearing on but <laughs> fuck you they're, what, just, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> they're setting themselves up it sounds of like they course. wanted him to swear eh? it wasn't coming on anyone's french fries and demanding they eat it so how did how did the uh, what year was that? It must have been in the late 70s. So the cars probably already started having teenage mm-hmm. like like little kid fans. So so oh, I guess. Yeah. So what are like 12? Well, that was part of it. The teenage well, what are the tw- yeah, what are the 12 year olds think of suicide? I mean, I bet there were a few that loved it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it was so it was so gutsy of Rick to put them on. Right. And he's you like, know, we're yeah, not going to yeah. play. We're wait, 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 wait. Yes and no. Wait, yes and no. No, no. I think it's perverse. And did he not know what the reaction? The thing is, only something like suicide would take the chance at knowing how hated they were going to be by opening for this fluffy, you know, rock band. <laughs> I mean, only Alan Vega would say, yeah, I'm going to do it because fuck you. I don't give a shit. So, right. I mean, I don't think it was gutsy of Rick, okay? Because what does he fucking care? He's not the one who's going to be bottled. Yeah, but he'd be pissing off his label. And- oh, well, no the, the, fucking Yeah, but him. the thing is, you know, I, and I know that I'm, I know they're friends, wow, but, wow. but I, whenever I, when you see like a cooler, more artsy band opening up for a, a mainstream pop band, a lot of times when they pull that move, I think the pop band wants the art cred by 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 endorsing Absolutely. it by, by by endorsing it, but then you know, a lot of times their fans are really tribal, really, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and they just really only strange. like this yeah. band. So they, so they kind of also in a weird way, it's a double edged sword. They kind of yeah. makes them look better because basically the opening act is alienated and ostracized, and then they're then they're, everyone goes nuts for them. So it's, uh, a, it's, it's really it's true, really really true, Tim. I mean, re- it, uh, yeah. not not uh, you know with intent or not, really freaking true. Or in our case, they just won't have us open for them because we're going to blow their fucking brains out. Hey, well, I mean, I'll, I'll blow them off the stage. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, but, you know, uh, you know, they were friends and Alan seems like he wanted to do it and he did it. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think that Rick, what you said about the, the art artistic, you know, Rick, want, Alan used to joke, Rick wanted to be Alan and of Alan wanted Rick's money so that he could do more. There you <laughs> go. Hello. More and you he know what? Want Rick's fans. He definitely did not want Rick's fans, but he definitely wanted Rick's research. Yeah, and you know, if only these motherfuckers who are so rich and want the cred would actually give up the fucking money. Like, you know, we have no problem if you want to buy our friendship because the only <laughs> reason we're going to hang out with you is if you fucking pay us. So go ahead. We're here. I'm free Saturday night, motherfuckers. Just send a check. Just well, saying, yeah. Bruce, well, also, Bon Jovi. Also, Ray, a, oh, Rick said, oh, well. In a very image conscious society, in a weird way, Alan kind of looked more mainstream than Riggo Kasich. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, Kasich think about an ugly rock star. Looks, looks, but, really, looks pretty insane, right? Well, I have to say, Rick wasn't as straight as you think. Rick was, Rick right. was pretty out there. I, I think mean, he was, just had a real clever way about writing pop, you sure. know, catchy pop hits. He had that sensibility. He was kind of dorky that way. Also, just production. Um, he, he understood what was going to oh. really sound good in a, in, in a car stereo. He just knew how to make it sound really <laughs> slick. For, recall the cars. Yeah. There, there you go. There you go. And he, I mean, he was, there is a history of really ugly rock stars, though. I mean, even we could go back to Roy Orbison, right. Joey, but, 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 but they were they were big in the Rick. MTV <laughs> era and MTV kind of filtered out a lot of the ugly rockers. Um, just because suddenly that's what people are looking at it more than listening to it. 
but but he definitely had his finger on the pulse of just how synthesizers were going to kind of take over popular mm-hmm. music and and just that totally. timbre. Yeah, the new wave was was close cousin yeah. to you know the the future, and I think uh, I think that's what, what a bad bad thing. What a bad <laughs> prophecy they knew would come true. Yeah. Well, I mean, suicide also was on top. Had their finger on the button of synthesizers. Of, yes. Yeah, Absolutely. but I mean, but in such a perverse way that sure. it could have been you, a machine gun. You could do psyche. anything with a synthesizer. So it's really yeah. it, unfortunately a lot a lot of people to have the factory preset ideas and not their own ideas so yeah they weren't they, exactly and they didn't have the dirt and the sex and the and the sweat that and, Alan and the pathology through. i mean yeah. and again i mean what was so beautiful about early suicide was the cross between early industrial total threat then doo-wop then romance, then murder. <laughs> I mean, this is what attracted, this is why I was so impressed the first time I saw them at Maxis, Kansas City. I'm like, this is my future. Musical but, schizophrenia. Uh, more than anything else, exactly. it, it doesn't come across as contrived. It just comes across as authentic and genuine. Yeah. And so with all that mashup of ideas, they're just stoic standing there and, and it's, it's them and you can well, and this and audience again, can sense that. Yeah. And it's it, back again to storytelling, which is what Alan was, which is why he liked hanging out at the Blarney Stone. He mm-hmm. was picking up on the stories of the street. He was living Every the man. stories from the street. Yeah. And then he was translating that into something that was a condensed, almost a forensic file mm-hmm. of emotion. I love that. He internalized it and he believed so strongly and he was so committed in what he was doing that he was prepared to die for it every night. I think that's what he loved about boxing too. It's the same kind of thing, right? You're literally putting your life on the line when you step out there on that stage. And also doing these shows, you know, recently doing Half Fell and Vega, Half Suicide, so many of the songs that we were covering, and by the way, we did Dream Baby Dream originally, but I'm like, uh, one minute of that, that's enough, it's too pop for me. But yeah. so many of the Alan Vegas songs that we were doing are really about, about war, about violence, and uh, not promoting it, expressing how expressing. it happens, class warfare, uh, you know, war, 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 which is of course, you know, the trumpet I've been blowing since, uh, 19, since Reagan, so. And it was great. It was great for me to do the songs that I could that had a basic lyrical structure that I could also go off on and extrapolate into some adding more spoken word, which I was, of course, channeling from the divinity of my hero, Ellen Vega. (laughs) Yes, that's what made it so special, Lydia. Nobody else could have done that the way you did it. I know that. Thank you. Because of that connection that you had. No, I know that. I was getting chills. I love it. It was unbelievable. Thank you. I I get myself chills. But then I no. am the I am the ice. No, I'm not the ice queen. I'm the volcano. That's right. All right. Well, anyway, we're gonna wrap this up because I feel so good. Anyway, I'm rubbing my own thighs because nobody else is, and I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. There is so much more to come from your own musical, you know, propulsions, the archives of Alan Vega, the art, and any help you need. I'm also here. So. Thank you, There's Lydia. So much to dig through. And, and it needs to be out there. And it's it what's does. interesting is again, you know, we saw how the audience reaction was in France. I mean, you were there. I mean, people just they're they're so happy that this stuff is being presented again with this the twist that we put on it, but just bringing this music alive is is, is I'm really honored to be able to do it. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And much love. And here we go. This is the Lydian Spin. You know that. 